This whole notion that this is, the black family has always been disintegrating, that, that is nonsense. That his, his studies go up to 1925, the great bulk of black families were intact, two-parent families up through 1925, and going all the way back through the era of slavery. So it is now only within our own time that we suddenly see this inevitable tragedy which the welfare system says it's going to rush in to solve. It's been 40 years since the show aired, and Thomas Sowell's writings continue to illuminate. Whether the topic is race, crime, immigration, or so many other subjects, his scholarship remains as relevant as ever. Racists may prefer one race to another, but they prefer themselves to everybody else. Thomas Sowell is a trained economist. He's a sociologist who has written books about virtually every culture that's ever existed. He is a photographer. He is America's greatest contemporary living philosopher. I'm Jason Riley. I'm a journalist and author. For more than two decades, I have closely studied the life and work of Thomas Sowell. His story is both fascinating and illuminating. Tom makes a very, very good point that general principles affect everybody, whether they're black, brown, or purple. Tom is fearless not just in advancing unpopular opinions, but in venturing into areas of scholarship that had been untrodden. Tom Sowell is known for his views on economics, history, race, and politics. But I've also discovered some lesser-known aspects of his life. His research and his writings about late-talking children, and the fact that he is a highly regarded world-traveling photographer. Over the next hour, we'll examine the life and career of Dr. Thomas Sowell, how he rose from humble beginnings to attend and teach at some of the nation's leading institutions, and became one of our foremost social commentators. You were a Marxist at one time in your life. What was your wake up to what was wrong with that line of thinking? Uh, facts. You're about to meet one of the greatest minds of the past half century. Funding for this program has been provided by L. E. Phillips Family Foundation, Robert and Marion Oster, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, Incorporated, DKT Liberty Project, the Charles and Ann Johnson Foundation, Chris and Melody Roofer. Well, because I was a Marxist at the time, and oh, they were they were they were appalled, and I said, you know, they they have very high intellectual standards, and I'm, I'm not going to find uh, ideological soulmates. I was still a Marxist. Uh, I took a summer job in the government, I got inter intern in economics. And it was seeing the government from the inside that, uh, that turned me around. The, the vision of the left, and I think many conservatives underestimate this, is really a more attractive vision uh, in itself. The only reason for not believing in it is that it's, it doesn't work. But you don't, but you don't see that at the outset. If all, all you're looking at is just a theory, if the world were the way the left conceives it to be, it would be a better world than the way the right conceives it to be. It just happens that the, the world is not that way. For me, Thomas Sowell is that rarest of species, an honest intellectual. He spent a career putting truth above popularity. He's explored the answers to questions others were afraid to even ask. He's followed the facts where they lead and accepted the findings, however unpopular, or politically incorrect. Thomas Sowell fervently stands by his well-researched beliefs, and he does not hesitate to let someone know if he thinks they're wrong. I've spent dozens of hours interviewing Tom, and hundreds more selecting stories he's told over the years to others, to help us understand what makes Thomas Sowell unique. Sowell's body of work is quite vast. It's covered everything from economics and history to culture, migration, and racial inequality. The main thing that he's done, in my opinion, is to cause people to rethink their assumptions about all sorts of things. Uh, not just economics, but about race, uh, about politics, about um, how, how we get along. Tom is absolutely fearless. I mean, he's forceful in his opinions. He will not compromise any of his opinions for the sake of social politeness. How do you take the measure of a man, especially if he's someone who's impacted our thinking about politics and economics for more than half a century? Do you do it through his deeds or influence? 
or by what he says or writes? Perhaps Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it best. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The media, the television and the print media, they've wised up. You can't argue with Tom, so you might as well hide what he's doing. And that's what they're doing. They're, 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 they're just ignoring what he's uh, written because they, there's no way that they can argue with Tom Sowell. What distinguishes Thomas Sowell's scholarship? First, intellectual honesty, asking the right questions, gathering the relevant data, and following the facts to their logical conclusion, even if that conclusion turns out to be unpopular. Second, the importance of incentives and the reality of trade-offs in addressing our social problems. Third, the belief that a group's upward mobility derives primarily from its development of human capital. And finally, Seoul has an abiding respect for social processes and existing institutions and the role they play in decision-making. So where did Tom Seoul's ideas come from? What formed the foundation of a man who would go on to become one of the country's foremost public intellectuals? That story began 600 miles to the south of Midtown Manhattan, more than eight decades ago. Thomas Sowell was born in Gastonia, North Carolina on June 30th, 1930. The Great Depression was just getting underway. And like many blacks in the South at the time, his family had no electricity no central heating, and no hot running water. Sowell's father died before Tom was born. And his mother, a maid, died in childbirth just a few years later. He was adopted by his great aunt and uh, raised by her and her uh, two daughters. So he had, was raised by three women. My whole career, would not have been possible without the particular family in which I was raised, which was not composed of educated people. I mean, nobody in that family had ever graduated from high school, and most had not graduated from grade school. But they were interested in education, and they were interested in me. Tom was raised by a great aunt and her adult children. The family moved to New York City's Harlem neighborhood, a migration that exposed him to better schools and more opportunities than were available to blacks in the segregated South. My great fear is that a black child growing up in Harlem today will not have as good a chance to rise as people of my generation did, simply because they will not receive as solid an education in an era when such an education is even more important. When Thomas Sowell was eight years old, his family moved from North Carolina to New York City and settled here at 720 St. Nicholas Avenue in the neighborhood of Harlem. The building looks pretty much the same as it did more than 80 years ago when the Souls moved in. Young Tommy, as he was called, ventured out into a big city for the very first time. He rode double-decker buses and learned to cross busy streets all by himself. We were much poorer than the people in Harlem and most other anywhere else today. It was my last year or two at home that we finally had a telephone. We had a radio. We never had a television. But in another sense, in the sense of the things you need to get ahead, I was enormously more fortunate than most of black kids today. While coming of age in Harlem, Sowell discovered the magic of education, thanks to a family friend named Eddie Mapp. In Harlem, there was a kid named Eddie that members of the family had run into before I ever arrived from North Carolina. He came from a highly educated family, and they uh, immediately saw the implications if they, if they could get him to mentor me. Eddie 
Eddie brought Tom here to the Harlem Public Library, taught him how to find books that interested him, taught him how to check them out. And I saw all these books, and I had no idea why we were there when I didn't have any money to buy one book. And so what am I going to do with all these, you know, hundreds of books up on the shelf? Crossing the threshold to this new world was the first step on a path young Tommy might not otherwise have taken. And he very patiently walked me through the whole thing. And again, I was very reluctant to take out a library card because I didn't know what, what all this is about. But he would talk me into it. Then I borrowed a couple of books. And really, had I not encountered him, the, the entire rest of the story could not have been the way it was. I mean, at some point, I would have learned what a public library was. But by that point, it would be too late. When you start getting in the habit of reading when you're eight years old, that's a different ball game than if you have to wait till you're a teenager and it's too late now. Thanks to that same friend, Eddie, a young Tom Soul was pointed in the right direction regarding his schooling. The grade school he attended in Harlem was a good one. But when it came time for junior high school, the one in Tom's neighborhood was not so great. When I finished elementary school, and they assigned me to a junior high school in a very bad neighborhood, and he told me, you can get transferred. And I got transferred to a much better school. Uh, had I gone to that other school, uh, I, again, the story would have been entirely different. He would become a firm believer in allowing parents to choose the best school possible for their children, whether it be private schools, religious schools, or even the option that sparks intense debate among lawmakers and educators today, charter schools. There are few things more dishonorable than misleading the young. The abysmal quality of education available in the ghettos today is one that I really don't think uh, the worst possible private school could match. 40 years ago, I received a far better education in Harlem than the people who are living in Harlem today have available to them. It's 8 a.m. at the Success Academy School in Harlem, New York. This is a charter school, an example of educational choice for people trying to better themselves despite the circumstances they were born into. For Tom, this is education done right. Professor Soule has been a leader in supporting all forms of school choice, and I very fundamentally agree that we need uh, more choices, not fewer. I think we particularly need that for our most vulnerable uh, populations. Back in 1978, when there was a push for a voucher scheme, the New Republic objected. In their words, the least educated, the least ambitious, and the least aware would be left in the public schools. Professor Soul grew up in Harlem. I grew up in Harlem. And the schools there have been a disaster for half a century. And so you have generations of kids who have not gotten uh, the education that they deserve and are entitled to. Charter schools are public, tuition-free schools that are open to all students and able to operate independently from the traditional school district. They are given the autonomy to design a curriculum tailored to the needs of their students. But they must also meet academic standards set by state and local officials. Unlike traditional public schools, however, charter schools that don't meet these standards can actually be shut down. with respect to education. Tom would say, it doesn't make any difference how much money you put in education, but if they're not some basic factors that you uh, must take into account, that is, in order for a kid to get a good education, somebody must make him go to bed on time. Somebody must make him do his homework. Somebody must make him mind the teacher. Somebody has to get him up in the morning. And if those things are not done, I don't care how much money you put into education, you're not going to get very good results. And that is precisely what we see. For decades, Seoul has been a strong supporter of charters 
and other education options for families trapped in underperforming schools. There are, as you said, many blacks today who are still being given totally inadequate education, yes. cannot be expected to get very far for that reason. What would be your remedy for that? I would allow their parents to have a choice of where to send them to school, whether that choice is called a voucher scheme, open enrollment, tuition tax credit, any kind of scheme of that sort. They would put that power in the hands of their parents, mainly because that would mean that the schools would have to be responsive to them. As it is now, the school is a monopoly. They need not be responsive. It is hard for me to understand what harm is going to be done by allowing parents to have a choice as compared to having self-interested bureaucrats have a monopoly. The things that they thought were going to help did not help, and in many cases, made things much worse. Thomas Sowell is a very private person. Despite having so much of his work put before the public, he's reluctant to give interviews and has been known to make journalists wait years before sitting down to talk about his life and work. But a colleague of mine took the time to get Tom to appear on his show. I'm Dave Rubin. I'm the host of The Rubin Report. It sets right back behind me here in my home. Uh, I do a long-form interview show. Everybody was saying, you've got to talk to Thomas Sowell. You've got to talk to Thomas Sowell. And it, we tried for about three or four years to, to hunt him down. And uh, finally, we were able to interview him. One of the things that I found out that was sort of amazing about your history, you, you briefly mentioned it right before we started, you were a Marxist at one time in your life. Most people will find this hard to believe, but it is true. But it's not that unusual. Uh, most of the, the leading conservative thinkers of our time time uh, did not start off as conservative. You had a couple like uh, Bill Buckley and uh, George Will. But I mean, Milton Friedman was a liberal and a Keynesian. Ronald Reagan was so far left, at one point the FBI was following him. Do you remember sort of what you were thinking, what appealed to you at that time about Marxism? Yes, I mean, there was no alternative being discussed. I treated my interview with him as Thomas Sowell 101. I wanted it to be for the new generation of young people who watch YouTube, who listen to podcasts. My first job was as a Western Union messenger. So I would take the Fifth Avenue bus. It would go all the way up Fifth Avenue past all these Lord and Taylor and all these fancy places. And then I would cross 57th Street, down Riverside Drive. And then as I came across this long viaduct that turned into 135th Street, suddenly there were the tenements. And I wondered, why is this? It's so different. And nothing in the schools or most of the books uh, seemed to deal with that. And Marx dealt with that. There's an absolutely beautiful moment where I ask him about his own political evolution. So then what was your wake up to what was wrong with that line of thinking? Uh, facts. <laughs> I love that moment. I mean, I knew the second he did it, I was like, we got our clip. That, that's as good as it gets. And it gets to what does this man care about most? Does he care about how he feels about things, how he wants the world to be, or how is the world as it is? Because that's what he's saying, I care about facts. The world is a certain way, and now, using that as the baseline, we can try to figure out how to make things better. Drafted in 1951, Tom joined the Marines, where he taught pistol shooting and took photographs. In fact, Sol was part of the Marine Corps Combat Camera Division. Combat Camera is responsible for the historical documentation. It may not necessarily make it out to the local paper, but somewhere down the line, someone might be able to pull up an image and say, OK, this happened during this time frame. The imagery is used as good reference to anything we may need in the future or something that's a uh, happening right now. Although Thomas Sowell left the Marines long ago, his legacy lives on today with some members of the Combat Camera Corps, who as young men discovered Sowell's work. 
When I was a young person, I, I used to like to stay home from school occasionally, I like to play hooky or pretend I was sick and stay home. But unlike most kids who'd you know, cut class and, and do whatever, I would watch videos of Thomas Sowell on Milton Friedman's show, Free to Choose, and he would just wipe the floor with people from the other side of the aisle that didn't seem like know what they were talking about. These were very smart people, but Thomas Sowell was so much smarter and so much more intelligent and so much more articulate that he would just make them seem like bumbling idiots, and I just thought that was awesome. When the private sector fails to create jobs at a fast enough rate, you find that people are unemployed and drift into needing help. I think it is overly broad to say that we turn people into helpless children. I don't remember talking to anyone who's ever been on welfare who didn't think they were being treated like children while they were on it. The lessons Soul learned in the Marines would stay with him for the rest of his life especially his love of photography, which would become Tom's artistic outlet while he pursued a life filled with studying facts and data. Photography did have connections to his, his vision of, uh, of re reality. Tom once commented to me that to be a photographer, you have to master trade-offs. All of the little adjustments that you fiddle with in the camera never involve making everything better or everything worse. It's a matter of trading one thing off to another. If you close down the diaphragm, then you get lots and lots of stuff in focus near to far. On the other hand, you're cutting down the amount of light. And a theme in Tom's work on society is that all policies involve trade-offs. And Tom often loses patience at people with sweeping visions. Here's how we can improve society. Here's a solution to a problem. And Tom points out in his political writings, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Just like photography. The University of Chicago is hallowed ground for Thomas Sowell. Here is where some of the most influential economic philosophies of modern times were formed. It's called the Chicago School of Economics. And it's where Tom would be mentored by intellectual giants like George Stigler and Milton Friedman, both of whom would go on to win the Nobel Prize in economics. I was a graduate student here from 1960 to 64. The thing I learned as a graduate student was economics is straightforward and simple when you grasp its underlying logic. And secondly, that logic can be applied seriously to understand many different things about the world. You know, in Chicago, if it was true, it was true because you could prove it was true. It was true because you had the evidence, you had the logic, and so forth. They explored the specific ways in which the market does and doesn't work. The idea, you know, that people are rational on the whole, and that if you allow those people to operate in the marketplace, you will generally get better results. The Chicago School of Economics is where Tom says he understood the importance of discipline and the importance of getting hard data. In fact, he talks more positively about his experience at University of Chicago than at Harvard, where he says a lot of people, in his opinion, went on emotion. Tom was a Marxist when he took a course with Milton Friedman, and at the end of the course, he remained a Marxist. But what he appreciated was that at University of Chicago, economics was a full contact sport where you had to defend your position rigorously, otherwise you got wasted. And so at least Tom Sowell said he came out understanding the importance of hard data. I mean, I was still a Marxist after taking Milton Friedman's course. Uh, but I, I went into, I, I, but, but one, one summer in the government was enough to let me say, no, this government is really not the answer. I mean, that is... <laughs> Milton Friedman didn't cure you, but the federal government the did. The federal government did. So what, never say the federal government doesn't do anything. <laughs> My first uh, professional job, I was a summer intern at the U.S. Department of Labor. One of my biggest concerns was about minimum wages. At first, I thought, well, this is good because all these people are poor and they'll get a little higher income, and so that, that'll, that'll be helpful. And then uh, as I studied economics, I began to see, well, there's a downside. They may lose their jobs completely, so that's, that is that. 
When I was at the Labor Department, I tried to talk about that to them, and eventually I came up with some test of it. And when I came up with how we might test this, I was waiting to hear congratulations, you see, that I had this. And I could see these people were stunned. They said, oh, this, this idiot has stumbled on something that would ruin us all. And I realized the U.S. Department of Labor had its uh, own agenda and interest. And that did not necessarily mean that whether poor people lost their jobs for minimum wages or got higher pay was their highest priority. Tom Sowell looked at the data, and the data found that minimum wage hikes uh, caused people who are unskilled to lose jobs. He found out that people in the government didn't give a rip whether or not it worked or didn't work. They were simply in implementing the policy. And that, that's what shocked him and caused him to begin to rethink lots of his assumptions. So it wasn't uh, academia that caused him to become more conservative. It was real life working for the government. I was now beginning to understand things I hadn't understood before. Tom, as I said, got his PhD here in 1968. He actually taught uh, in the years leading up to that at, at Cornell, which feeds back also to this just tumultuous times in the 1960s uh, in the country. Huge demonstrations at Cornell actually shut down the university for some time. In 1965, Thomas Sowell took a teaching position at Cornell. Like many other colleges, it became a focal point for anti-war and anti-discrimination protests and demonstrations. When armed black students took over a building on campus, Seoul had little sympathy for school administrators. Blacks had been recruited to Cornell under lower standards to diversify the student body. And Seoul observed that many of these same students were now causing trouble and feeding racial divisions. For Seoul, it was an example of the unintended consequences of affirmative action. Tom's tenure at Cornell had a very profound impact on him, uh, particularly surrounding the campus protests. I think it, it left a very, very bitter taste in his mouth. Uh, yes, I think it did. He discovered that many black students at Cornell their SAT scores were above the average, but they are having problems at Cornell. And that's when he first came up with the idea of people being mismatched. The, that is, uh, black students who would do very well at other schools, uh, but were recruited in the name of affirmative action to schools where they were in over their heads. The average black student at MIT is in the bottom 10% of M MIT students in math but he is in the top 90% of all American students in math. Something like one fourth of all the black students going to MIT do not graduate. You're talking about a pool of people whom you are artificially turning into failures by mismatching them with the school. Tom had moved to UCLA to escape the turmoil at Cornell and then jumped into the turmoil at UCLA I was sitting in my office at UCLA one day when the Black Student Association delegation marched into his office. I heard all of this. And one of them said, well, how you doing, brother? Tom, just a minute. I am not your brother. I am Mr. Soul, and you will address me that way. Boy, was that a shock to those folks. Here was their natural ally laying down the law. You're gonna treat me the way I'm going to treat you as another human being face to face. And if you don't like that, you can leave. I first met Tom in 1969 when I was a student at UCLA. I just walked in his office one day and I said that I understand that uh, you and I have similar ideas on matters of, uh, of economics. And we started talk from there. You and Sol used to joke about how few black conservatives there were in the country back in the 70s and 80s. Has much changed since then? And what, what was it like back then? There were relatively uh, few blacks that we knew of that were uh, kind of free market, limited government. It was Bill Buckley who made the suggestion that the EPA does not allow Tom Sowell and I to fly uh, on one plane together because we're endangered species. 
Tom's done something in his career that one of his mentors, Milton Friedman, felt was important to do also. And that is share his knowledge of economics with non-economists, with non-intellectuals. The true test of whether someone understands a subject, the true test comes when he can explain it to someone who does not know a darn thing about it. And Tom has the gift of being able to do that, to be able to explain potentially complex ideas in economics to the ordinary person. I haven't been able to find a single country in the world where the policies that are being advocated for blacks in the United States have lifted any people out of poverty. I've seen many examples around the world of people who began in poverty and ended in affluence. Not one of them has followed any pattern at all like what is being advocated for blacks in the United States. Uh, many groups have remained in poverty for a very long time trying to follow those patterns. At one time, black Americans did not have the constitutional guarantees that, as everybody else, now we do. But because the civil rights struggle is over and won, and we're not facing the kind of gross racial discrimination of the past, does not mean that they're not major problems. I'm very sure that Tom would say that the 75% rate of illegitimacy among blacks is a devastating problem, but it's not a racial problem. It's not a legacy of slavery. The, the crime that uh, I believe Tom would say as well, that the crime we see in many black communities is a devastating problem, but it has nothing to do with racial discrimination. If you have always believed that everyone should play by the same rules and be judged by the same standards, that would have gotten you labeled a radical 50 years ago, a liberal 25 years ago, and a racist today. Thomas Sowell may be an intellectual, but it would be a mistake to believe that only academics and economists believe in what Tom has to say. I never heard never damage. I am most certainly handy single. In a small recording studio just outside of downtown Dallas, a young rapper hones his craft. It feels good to be back in this booth. And shout out to you, you back in me, then you back in the truth. You actually knew. And I ain't have to tell you, so sit back, let it soothe the inaculate dude. Eric July hey. is a man on a mission. Hand is singly top tier, meaning you not. Eric is out to make great music and to educate people like himself about his hero. And I'm something like a great how. Anywhere Thomas Sowell is, he's the smartest person in the room. I would most definitely just tell him that he's been my biggest inspiration, hands down. Eric fronts the rap metal band backwards and uses his music to get a message across with politically charged lyrics, many of them inspired by Thomas Sowell. He has emerged as an influential young voice who has outspoken in his support for individual freedom and less government intervention. You see somebody like Sol, who has been doing what he has been doing, getting out there and speaking uh, what he has been speaking, uh, overcoming the odds that he had to certainly uh, overcome in his, in his growth. And you also feel like you can conquer the world. It just goes to show from a generational standpoint how he's been able to influence somebody, you know, like me. People probably tired of hearing me talk about it because I'm always referencing Thomas Sowell. People ask me, well, you used to be this. What happened? I'm like, well, that, that enlightenment period, it had to do with Thomas Sowell. Most people have not recognized the fact that, in, that if you go back into the 20s, you find that married couple families were much more prevalent among blacks then than today. As late as 1930, blacks had lower unemployment rates than whites. So all these things that we complain about and, and attribute to the era of slavery, those things should have been worse in the past than in the present. But in fact, they're worse in the present than in the past. And I think if you want to look for a turning point, it would be since the 1960s. And what happened in the 1960s? You began to have not only the welfare state, you began to have the mindset that goes with the welfare state so that there was no stigma any, any longer attached, for example, to being on relief or welfare. Those topics of welfareism um, and how they have affected black 
you know, communities and black, black families, it, it's tough. It's a hard pill to swallow. Just how welfareism doesn't incentivize people to fail. It's the state saying that so as long as you fail, you know, you'll get this money. You'll get this money, we'll take care of you, housing, whatever you need. But the minute you get above this line, you know, the minute you get, you see this amount of success, we're gonna strip it all away from you. In 1980, Thomas Sowell came here, the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Upon accepting the offer, his teaching days were over. Thousands of students would miss out on having Professor Sowell as a teacher, but millions of intellectually curious readers would benefit from Thomas Sowell's work here. I don't think Tom Sowell ever really liked being a teacher. I don't think he ever liked standing in front of people uh, and, and being a professor. When Hoover offered him the opportunity to basically pay him to be Tom Sowell, uh, he took it. And he can write what he wants to write, when he wants to write, uh, as much or as little, but he's always been very, very productive. And I think the independence and the freedom is what he liked. So you're good friends with Thomas Sowell, yeah. have been for a while. How would you describe Tom to someone who's never met him before? I'd say Tom is an empiricist, and by that I mean Tom looks at evidence, and then he makes a diagnosis, and then he offers a therapy for the perceived problem, and then he offers a prognosis, and he's not interested as much, or if at all, on how people interpret that or what are the ramifications in contemporary political terms of his argument. You point out that depending on where you come from in a foreign country, also makes a considerable difference because you, you carry your ethos on your back, don't you? Yes, that if you look at the Chinese who came to the United States, let's say, before World War II, a very large percentage of those came from one district in one province in southern China. The people who've come in since World War II have largely not come from that same area. They've come in with a different set of experiences and backgrounds and values. Many of them are the poverty-stricken Chinese that you see in the Chinatowns of New York and San Francisco, working the very long hours, getting the very low pay, living in the slums, packed into the rooms, you know, s several people to a room, and so on. Again, it would be hard to make the argument that this is simply a matter of the way the American employer sees it. The American employer is probably totally unaware that there are two different kinds of Chinese. It's only the people who work with the data who make those separations. It takes considerable knowledge just to realize the extent of your own ignorance. Thomas Sowell may be an academic by training, but he is not one to rely solely on books. To gather material for his extensive writings on culture and migrations, for example, he became a boots-on-the-ground researcher who traveled the world. As an amateur photographer, he often documented these trips through the lens of his camera. His purpose was to try and understand the role of cultural differences, both within nations and between them, and not only today, but throughout history. Sowell's travels led to pioneering studies and several books that detail the cultural patterns and development of different groups around the world. He went around the world and analyzed virtually every culture present and past to find out their strengths and weaknesses, why some survived, why some perished. One of Tom's discoveries was that much about the fate of different human civilizations and cultures can be explained ultimately by their geography. Too often the influence of geography on wealth is thought of narrowly in terms of natural resources that translate directly into wealth, such as oil in the Middle East or gold in South Africa. But important as such differences are, geography influences even more profound cultural differences among the peoples themselves. Why did Europe conquer Africa instead of vice versa? Well, there are a number of ways in which civilizations become complex, primarily through the uh, aggregation and exchange of ideas. 
sophisticated cultures are ones that sit in the middle of a catchment area where innovations from other cultures can be aggregated in kind of greatest hits collections. And so geography that allows movement of people and ideas with rivers, with highways, intersections of highways, port cities tend to become more culturally sophisticated. A lot of his research, as you mentioned, has focused on why some groups excel and others do not. But that curiosity um, is not necessarily appreciated by, <laughs> by a lot of people who seem to, to, to um, approach it from the standpoint that um, if a culture isn't rising, it's someone else's fault. Yes. Someone else is keeping them down. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, if America is up here, it is at the expense of this group or this country or this region. He doesn't, he doesn't take that, no, that what, approach. What Tom did when he talked about comparative cultures, he went to this quite narrow and unheralded group of scholars that talked about economics, and then he took that data, superimposed it onto history questions. So when people who were critical of Tom would say, well, he hasn't read this particular historical work, or he wasn't quite uh, appreciative of this great novel or this great history or this, he, they didn't understand that what he lost as being an economic historian, he gained in really trying to explain how cultures were successful or how much dominance they had in trade by actually looking at economics. And most historians, you know, they think that ec economics is a dismal science and they, they're not trained to do that. The first lesson of economics is scarcity. There is never enough of anything to fully satisfy all those who want it. The first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. I wanted to explore how Seoul's concepts on free markets have influenced business leaders today. A perfect example can be found in Salt Lake City, Utah at Overstock.com, one of the most successful online retailers in the world. Aaron Hunsaker, an Overstock employee, has been heavily influenced by Thomas Sowell's ideas. He credits much of its success to the free market economic principles championed by Thomas Sowell. I discovered Thomas Sowell like every good thinker discovers things in the modern day on YouTube. I was watching a Milton Friedman video and I see Thomas Sowell speaking with Milton Friedman. And I was like, wow, this guy is really, really smart. And he gave a real rigorous, as rigorous as you could be on TV, but a real rigorous answer to a question, I really appreciated that. And I just kind of went down the YouTube wormhole with Thomas Sowell. And then I saw that he'd written like, you know, 10 or a thousand books or something like that. He has tons of books. And I just started to explore him. And the more I explored Thomas Sowell, he talked a lot about incentives in institutions, government institutions. I come from kind of a punk rock, hardcore background, and I had an incentive to be more left and angry because it makes better music. You don't hear a whole lot of music about, oh, well, if I work really hard and we base it off meritocracy, things will be great. But upon kind of digging into Thomas Sowell's thought process, I realized that it's far more punk rock to base things off of individual freedoms and thought. I see him as someone who has constantly strived to be consistent. And to those that want to be consistent, you have to study geography. You have to study history. You have to study political philosophy. You have to study journalism. You have to study all of these subjects as a whole and see how you can put together a view that makes them consistent with each other. That's why I think Thomas Sowell is so well-versed and such a uh, renaissance man. 
I grew up in an era when people, particularly blacks, were a lot poorer than today, faced a lot more discrimination than today, and in which the teenage pregnancy rate was a lot lower than today. I don't believe there is a predestined amount of teenage pregnancy, a predestined amount of husband desertion. Gutman has done a study of the black family showing that this whole notion that this is, the black family has always been disintegrating, that, that is nonsense. Some things are believed because they are demonstrably true, but many other things are believed simply because they have been asserted repeatedly. In the 1990s, Seoul took up a new area of research, the phenomenon of late-talking children. For Tom, it was personal. I met Tom Sowell through language. I am a cognitive scientist. I study language. I wrote a book on language. And I got a letter out of the blue from uh, Professor Sowell. His son was a late talker. But contrary to some of the uh, diagnosis that he got from so-called experts, he didn't believe that his son was uh, retarded or autistic, just that uh, his language was late in developing. He just did not talk. This meshed with my own understanding of the relationship between language and thought, namely, they're not the same thing. So I wrote to Tom saying, your intuition about your son is consistent with my understanding. Tom Soule sought out answers. Eventually, his son, John, not only began to speak, but to excel. Soule wrote about this remarkable journey in his landmark book, Late Talking Children. Tom discovered that there was a syndrome that many famous scientists, engineers, mathematicians would also have uh, acute spatial ability and numerical ability, but uh, were late in developing the ability to speak. One of those impacted was Los Angeles-based writer Jennifer Van Lahr, whose own young son, Sam, wasn't talking at all. When Sam was about 18 months old, he wasn't really talking. He just babbling, no word that we could make out to be an English word. So I started looking online and saw late talking children and then Dr. Thomas Sowell and, and said, oh, I definitely want to read what he has to say because I respect him as an intellectual. I had already noticed in Sam that he would build different uh, block towers with different patterns repeating over and over. He would have movies that he just loved watching over and over, and one of them was Charlotte's Web, and another one was Shrek. And so I would come and, and find ABC blocks on the floor or on the refrigerator, spelling out, uh, and even write out Lucasfilm, <laughs> which is pretty big for a three-year-old to be able to do. So the fact that Sowell's book talked about bright children, I thought, I don't think he's dumb. Let's look into this. So I uh, went to go see Dr. Camarada to get an evaluation. And they gave us a full plan of what we could do to help him to be able to acquire language and be successful in school. When Sam started piano and, and he had been so advanced in that first year, at the end of the year they had a, a recital and he still wasn't talking in more than one sentence, maybe two, but he got up and he introduced his piece and it was Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. It made me cry. I sent the video of that to the camaradas and said how proud I was of him and thanked them for the help they had given us. And they asked if they could send it to Dr. Sowell. Said, go ahead. And then they emailed back and said that Sowell had really loved watching the video of Sam. Just the fact that he would care about this five-year-old said a lot to me about who he sees himself as. The course of history is determined by what people do with their opportunities. Sowell has written a great deal about the importance of human capital in a group's advancement, the development of skills and habits and attitudes in advancing a group economically. And a good example of what he's talking about can be found on 6th Avenue in Manhattan at the Steinway Piano Company. President and CEO Ron Lowsby 
explains how the history of Steinway aligns with Thomas Sowell's theories. We still follow the tenet that Heinrich Engelhard Steinweg started uh, with the company with, and that is to build the best piano possible. They were uh, living in Ziesen in the Hartz Mountain area of northern Germany. At that time, there was a lot of political upheaval in Germany, and they had the guild system. I think you would call it the apprentice system today, and it had really strict rules. And Heinrich was just so full of ideas on how to build the best piano that he possibly could that he was impatient, and he didn't want to uh, wait until he had graduated from this system. On his own, Heinrich created a few pianos. And while they were favorably received, the economic restrictions in Germany at the time made him realize that if he was to succeed, he would have to take his skills elsewhere. What gave him the impetus to come to the new world, New York City, where there was less restriction, there was less, you know, regulation. Heinrich changed the family's last name to the more American-sounding Steinway. They created an instrument that, within 10 years, they became the most successful, most profitable, the best piano company built uh, in America. Very often people talk as if uh, some group has taken control of some industry, and they wonder how did that happen. And in most cases, they created the industry. The industry didn't exist before they got there. That's how they took control of it. Heinrich's decision to relocate to America is a good example of one of Thomas Sowell's core beliefs, that individuals carry with them their skills, no matter where they go, and can succeed if permitted to do so without cumbersome government regulations. It's amazing how much panic one honest man can spread among a multitude of hypocrites. Listen to this list. The Thomas Sowell Reader, 2011. Intellectuals and Race, 2013. A new edition of your classic work, Basic Economics, in 2014. Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, 2015. And now, 2018, Discrimination and Disparities. And do you know what I just did? I just listed the books you've published since turning 80. <laughs> Thomas Sowell's essays and weekly columns have appeared in more than 300 newspapers and periodicals, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and Fortune magazines. While many found Sowell's empirically-based arguments insightful, oftentimes they created a backlash, especially among those in academia. You once told me that Tom's not interested in making people happy or angry. He's interested in telling people what the data show. What the data shows, and he is counter, uh, he can be a contrarian in the sense that often areas that are unpopular or they're plagued with false knowledge or misconceptions, he gravitates toward those because that intrigues him to see if that's actually the popular opinion is actually true. And often it's not, he finds it's not. And then the results tend to bother people that he's so dispassionate about it. And then as an African-American intellectual, he's supposed to fit a preconceived intellectual, academic, ideological position. And it's not that he doesn't, he's just not interested in it. He doesn't make friends or enemies based on tribal considerations or popular consensus. On December 27th, 2016, Thomas Sowell published his weekly newspaper column. I'd read his column for decades and always look forward to it. But this one was different. Thomas Sowell was saying goodbye. Within minutes, the internet lit up with thousands of comments about Tom retiring from writing his column. Most of the postings were along the lines of, say it isn't so. I did that after spending some time in, in Yosemite with a couple of uh, photo buddies. And I realized that in those four days, we hadn't watched a single news program. We hadn't seen a single newspaper. I said, this, this is the life. I don't need to be watching, because 
Most of the foolish things that are said on these programs were said 20 and 30 and 40 years ago and refuted 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. By you quite often, but you're happier when you're not reading the news. Absolutely. But at the same time, you're also happier when you're working on a book. Yes, when I can go out there and get the hard data uh, and find out what's really happening. In dozens of books and numerous television appearances and thousands of columns, Sowell has championed his philosophy of free markets and personal responsibility while weathering the storms of challenge and controversy. Sowell has spent his adult life proudly sharing his political and economic beliefs. For some, he's a clear thinker full of common sense. Others say he lacks empathy. What no one can doubt is the courage of this maverick intellectual. If you could offer one sentence of counsel to some sophomore or junior who's watching this today. It's, it's not over till it's over, as Yogi Berra said. And uh, I would say to this young person, if we, through some miracle, get through this, please take to heart the lesson of what happens when you vote on the basis of uh, rhetoric and symbolism and instead of using your mind. Uh, it doesn't matter how smart you are unless you stop and think. In your early days at Harvard, you were either going to make it or not going to make it, and you shut yourself up and made yourself make it. Many people are trying to uh, insulate young people from adversity, insulate them from the things that give them strength. Thomas Sowell, Common Sense in a Senseless World, is now available on DVD. For more information or to order a DVD of this program, call one 800 876 8930 or visit www.freetochoose.net. Funding for this program has been provided by L.E. Phillips Family Foundation, Robert and Marion Oster, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, Incorporated, DKT Liberty Project, the Charles and Ann Johnson Foundation, Chris and Melody Roofer.